Thank you very much for inviting me, and thanks for organizing this. It's been great fun. Uh, Bertrand did such a great job that I don't need to do any preliminaries and don't need to do any review. I should say that the dragons pervade this general area of infinite loop space theory. I have made many, many mistakes in the past. I have made many recent mistakes. They all are variants of the same mistake. <laughs> and Bertrand's comment is completely correct. The, the pairing don't have the property that I originally defined for a pairing of operads. But <laughs> <laughs> the little cubes operads, the Steiner operads, Little disk operands, those have pairings that fit my original definition and do feed into infinite loop space theory in a just fine way, no problem at all. Every operand in any symmetric monoidal category has a pairing, starting with this miserable pairing that uh, Bertrand wrote down. But for some operands, that pairing is, has some good properties, and that's going to be very relevant to what I say later. Uh, so, this talk uh, is, in a sense, a sequel to a uh, talk that I gave last May, and I'm not going to repeat much that we said there. Just one addendum to Bertrand's talk. He gave two machines, one due to Siegel Shimakawa, and the one due to myself. In the previous talk, I explained how you can compare those two machines explicitly and prove that they are equivalent. Uh, and so, but one has advantages that the other does not have. For example, the pairings that I described uh, over there fit perfectly into my machine and are relevant to the Siegel machine. And that, those pairings, I suspect, are going to have applications in factorization homology, which builds uh, global information for local information, and the local information is just the sort of thing that my machine was designed to see. All right. This talk's also online uh, on, on my web page, and the subject is infinite loop G category theory, in the sense starting from where Bertrand ended. So you want to know how to process information that is given in terms of G categories and produce G spectra out of that information and in such a way that all good multiplicative properties that you can imagine hold. So here's a, I'm going to very briefly, even briefer than I had planned, thanks to Bertrand, uh, summarize the, this, this is my notation for the siegel Shimakawa. Uh, Mona, Merling, and Yelica Osorno machine that, uh, equivariantly. Uh, and then just recall the triviality that B, the classified space functor, has good properties. And then the whole rest of the talk is going to be how to go from sensible categorical input to FG categories, which is just functors from F to the category of G categories as Bertrand described. So I'm going to put us in a general context which allows us to do equivariant work without working equivariantly and could conceivably have motivic application later on. Because everything I'm going to do is formal. Uh, so I'm then going to talk about uh, symmetric monoidal V categories, which work in the special case of interest called G-symmetric D categories and then describe uh, how to go from additive input just you know, on spectrum to get to spectra, to G spectra, then the multiplicative input and how to get to the multiplicative theory to uh, outline to, 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 the, to, to uh, multiplicative information on G spectra. 
And when I gave a practice talk in Chicago, people complained that I stopped without giving enough applications and examples. So Akhil gave a beautiful worked example of how you take exactly what I'm saying today and what Mona will say later on in the afternoon and take it as a black box and prove real theorems, calculationally explicit, starting with this precise input. Uh, the point I really want to make is that there is beautiful, beautiful category theory that was developed in Australia that none of, I bet nobody in the room knows. And two months ago, I didn't know the relevant theory at all. And it turns out to be exactly the right thing to solve the problem of going from multiplicative input on the level of pseudo-structure to output on the level of FG categories, which then feeds into what uh, Mona and Angelica and I did to end up with multiplicative properties on the level of G spectra. I hope everybody agrees that having good multiplicative property on G spectra is a good thing. OK. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show the rest as we go along. So this is a review of what uh, Bertrand told you already. F is the category of finite phase sets. He had bold phase F, I have script F. Our collaboration, we never agree on notation. So all the notations are slightly different. Uh, and FG space is nothing but a functor to G spaces. And everything's going to be reduced, so there's no problem about base versus unbased spaces. And the idea of the Siegel machine, Bert told you what specialness is. And the idea is that this is peculiar, though it is, is the right notion of equivalence to think of the motivation as a product up to homotopy on G spaces with all higher homotopies built in from the structure of the functor from F into G spaces. So I'm giving us credit because this point that I want to emphasize here is the way we get this uh, construction. We have a modification of the Siegel tree macaw, which is definitely different from what they originally did. And it gives you the property that this functor from G spaces to G spectra is actually lax symmetric monoidal and has good homotopical properties. It is a group completion, uh, which means that you have a group completion of H fixed points for all subgroups of H. OK. So if we have a topological G category in here, by topological you know, G category. What's wrong with just evaluating the G gamma space on G spheres? Isn't that like symmetric monoidal? I'm sorry? What is wrong with just evaluating the G gamma space on G spheres? Isn't that like symmetric monoidal? It's not? And Yelp no. says no. <laughs> the, the, the symmetry doesn't work well. I, I assume you're taking the smash part of gamma spaces in the darkest Yeah, sense. so that one is lax monoidal, but not lax symmetric monoidal. <laughs> okay. okay. There was something to do, and it was subtle. As usual, what happened is um, uh, Mona and, and Yelp found a mistake that I had made. And in correcting the mistake, Angela can notice, hey, what you've done makes it symmetric monoidal. I hadn't seen that. OK. So, uh, oh, sorry. Special uh, FG categories are defined just as for FG spaces. So another, one, another way of saying it is, when you apply the classifying space functor, what you get is special. And then there's an easy theory, theorem, it's not a theorem, it's just an observation, that the classifying space functor from topological FG categories to FG spaces is symmetric monoidal and takes special FG categories to special FG spaces. And since uh, Stefan's uh, question interrupted me a little bit, I lost my train of thought. By a topological G category, I mean that the source, identity, ident and composition are maps of G spaces. You have a G space of objects and a G space of morphisms 
And so with this point of view, uh, the previous slide's theorem generalizes the theorem that Bert quoted because G spaces sit inside G topological G categories. You just take a G space and take it as the space of objects, the space of morphisms, identity, source, target, and composition, and nothing but the identity. And that's a perfectly good topological G category. All right. So, as I said, I want to do equivariant theory without working equivariantly. It clears the mind. It makes it easier to think, at least for me. And so the other point is that it separates formal arguments from things that are specific to the relevant context. So everything that I am doing will work with the any by complete, co-complete, complete, closed symmetric monoidal category, not just G spaces, which is the case that we're immediately interested in. And uh, uh, Mark told me that there is a new paper out which does additive uh, infinite loop space theory motivically. This theory will probably eventually feed right in and give a multiplicative elaboration of that. Whose paper is this? Uh, Mark Hardwart? I don't know. Um, it's a series of papers by Panini. And again, we have internal V categories for any V. And to abbreviate the notation, I'm just going to call F algebra. Is that, that just means functors from F into the category of internal <laughs> to V. OK. It's a two category. V functors, V natural transformations, V modifications. The language is horrible. But just think of zero cells, one cells, and two cells. And that's what they are. I think of the mod of modifications as kind of uh, uh, homotopies between natural transformations. And in a real sense, that's what they are. Is it strict? Is it a is, strict? Is there a question? Is it a strict two category? I'm sorry? Is the two category strict? Two categories will be strict today. I'm not going to do any by categories. One of the features of the uh, Australian category theory school is they like to do things strict. So it's what some people, some modern category theorists call evil. And they're very evil. <laughs> Old-fashioned evil algebraic topologists. I want to do everything that I can do strictly and will do so. So G spectra is orthogonal G spectra. It's symmetric monoidal under the smash product. We have the compo composite of the Siegel machine and the classifier space functor, and that takes us symmetric monoidally from F categories to G spectra. Preserves all the multiplicative structure, everything else that you could possibly want. And now I want to get categorical machinery that starts with additive and multiplicative input and has additive and multiplicative output in F algebras. Does everybody see the motivation? See where we're headed? You can then compose whatever I show you today with uh, SG composed with B, and that gets us all the information we want on the level of G spectrum. OK. Additive input. Hey, I don't need to tell you this slide. Bert told you it in much better detail than I could possibly imagine. So pseudo functors, you should think of pseudo as a shorthand way of saying up to invertible two set. So for a pseudo action, you, you have laws for an action of a, mon of a monoid on an object. And those things don't hold strictly. Now they hold up to an invertible two set. That's what the two cells are there for. OK. And this, the complete definition is in the literature. Uh, Corner and Gursky did another paper. I should have said what I advertised on the second slide. There is huge input from Lack, Steve Lack, John Power, Nick Gursky, and Mike Schulman behind the scenes. They're, every time we got stuck, 
I sent an email to one of them, and out came the answer. So this is doing research by finding it out to people who already know the answer. So just uh, uh, cat eg, that means functors from eg. I use script e for what Bertrand used, boldface e, but it's the same thing. It's just that functor that he described for you. It's the g. Uh, and, and then uh, uh, the script G is my notation for taking the functor category of morphisms from EG into anything. And uh, if you take the G fixed points on that, that's a functor that was introduced and used heavily by Thomason ages ago. It's nothing new. And uh, commutative categories have an action of G. Symmetric monoidal G category. Oh, yeah, I skipped a slide. Okay, right. Now we're, this is again what just what Bert told, right? So we have the notion of a Bermuda G category and a symmetric monoidal G category. Bert put a G in front, and he's probably right. That's a good notation. The thing that we don't want to confuse this with is uh, not the same as G-symmetric monoidal category in the sense of Mike's talk. That's a different notion. There are relations between them. We're not going to talk about them. I just mean a G category with extra structure. OK, so uh, philosophically, in the category theory literature, there's a difference between biased ways of specifying structure. You specify a Permutativity, a permutative, op, a permutative category, all you need is A cross A cross A. You don't need A cross A cross A cross A. To specify a symmetric monoidal category, you need the fourfold Cartesian product, but you don't need the fifth fold. The operatic formulation is unbiased. You look at all of the n-fold products at once and the relationship between them. And turned monadically, this is looking at algebraic structures as quotients of free structures. OK. So I'm going to give a name to the category. The PG pseudo-algebras, it's a two-category with pseudo-algebras and pseudomorphisms. And there's going to be a category of operators generated by this. There's a paper. Thomas and myself from, oh God, around 1980 or so, where we prove uh, 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 axiomatization of infinite loop space machines. And we introduced the notion of a category of operators to do this. So it's intermediate between operat actions, as Bert described, and the Siegel machine. It's something in between. So it's a, ca a category of operators is a category that maps onto F has included the subcategory of permutations, projections, and injections, and is specified very simply. It's not hard to make a category out of an operator. It's just dead easy. You just do it. OK. And then we have d pseudo-algebras and pseudomorphisms, d algebras, which the category literature focuses on, where the algebras are strict, but the morphisms are not. The morphisms are pseudomorphisms. <coughs> And then there's a category with strict algebras and strict morphisms. Don't worry if you don't remember these. The one to focus on is the first one, because we're going to be going from there to F algebras, which is our goal. OK. This, there, was supposed to, there was supposed to be a pause here. Uh, <laughs> focus on the starting point where we're starting with Categories with a pseudo action of the G commutativity operat. Then we have an associated category of operators and its pseudo algebras. We get from here to here in a simple minded way. You start with an algebra and just take the actual nth powers. And that's a perfectly good right adjoint to the first object functor. This is all going on in cat B. 
ST is strictification. This is uh, something invented by category theorists in several incarnations over decades. There is an original construction due to street, which I used to love and is obsolete from our point of view. There's another construction which is just achingly beautiful by power and a lack, which we took seriously for a long time, and that led us into huge difficulties. Here lay dragons, despite its simplicity. And I'm going to give you a different construction, which is due to Steve Lack, and which is the one I want to advertise. Uh, the bottom functor, this one here, is very easy. It's just a categorical tensor product. It's a co-equalizer. It's trivial to construct. And it's just the left adjoint to the pullback of action. If you have an F algebra, you just regard it as a D algebra by using the projection from D to F. And I'll come back to the triangle. All right. Bert mentioned multi-categories. You should think of a multi-category. Uh, the li literature has uh, operands with many objects or colored operands as synonymous terms. For us, multi-categories must be symmetric. And for a symmetric monoidal category, you have an obvious multi-category associated. It has k-morphisms. That's the maps x1 tensor x to y in the underlying category you start with. And there's nothing fancy going on. And since this is lax symmetric monoidal, it gives a multifunctor from the multi-category of this symmetric monoidal category to the multi-category of the category of G spectra. Nothing just reviewing what I said earlier. So for any V, the target of our categorical machine is the uh, multi-category of F algebra. So that's synonymous with this in the case of G spaces. Okay. Everybody with me? Good. Uh, we can form a multi-category associated to some categories that are not symmetric monoidal. And the picture you should have, it's the same formal structure, exactly the same, except that uh, your data is complicated by the use of two cells, which are just intrinsically there and unavoidable. And so we're going to describe very briefly the multi-category of pseudo-algebras over suitable operads and the multi-category of d pseudo algebras for suitable categories of operators, such as the one associated to the operad we started with. Everybody clear what we're doing? OK. So multiplicative input. We start with. A pseudo-commutative opera. I'm not going to tell you what the hell that is. Just the operands we care about, P and PG and many others, are examples, but not all are. It's those operands that have their canonical uh, pairing that comes from the pairing of symmetric groups having certain good properties that were formulated by Corner and Gursky. Nothing original. It just works. OK. So a k-morphism is just a one cell. That's a functor between a v functor from the Cartesian product to v. And invertible distributivity two cells. Why is this distributivity? Well, going around this way, we're taking a, a, an n-fold product on ai, right? and then taking our functor f. Going the other way, well, we use diagonals on the A's other than AI and flip the AN, ON out front to map to here. And then take F to the N, which makes perfect sense now that we've adjusted the input, and then take the action of the target, V. And that, you write it down for N equals 2, and, oh yeah, that's distributivity. So we have to have distributivity two cells. And then you have to write down the coherence data. It's a little complicated, but no big deal. It's done. OK. Multicategory of D is similar. There's a notion this time due to Highland and power, two category theorists. Highland is at Cambridge power. I think it's still at Manchester. I'm not sure. Anyway, 
they formulated a notion of a pseudo-commutative monad, and this is the right analog on the level of categories of operators. So to hell with the word, it's just something that makes things work. Uh, and again, the one cells are just uh, maps like this, functors. But now we have invertible distributed two cells. Now only one of them, not a sequence, uh, del 1 up through del k, just one of them. And it's going from uh, f and f with the action on the x's here and the action on the target y over there. So it's a distributivity isomorphism. And again, we have complicated but straightforward coherence data. OK. Theorem. If you start with this good kind of operator and take its category of operators, you get a good kind of category of operators. And the obvious functor R extends to a multifunctor. And the proof is just follow your nose. It's nothing hard. You just do it. It took us ages, but you know, it's just there's, there's no choice of details or what you do. You just follow your nose and it works. Note the essential point. When we had the category of operators, we had to have a whole bunch of distributivity, two cells, one for each of the input guys. But when we get to multi D, hey, we only need one distributivity isomorphism. OK, so far, this is exactly what, what we knew in May. The rest is all changed, and I'm going to give you a little breather. Frank Adams liked to prepare his jokes in advance. And somehow, when I saw the new way of doing things, I was reminded of a letter that Frank once wrote me. Back in the old days, this is long before email. So his handwriting was inscrutable. John was a student of his and will know. But he. I asked for some work that he'd done, and he wrote this charming thing. I'll let you read it, because I can't mimic his accent. <laughs> Everybody there? He assumed that I knew oh. it. What? It takes a long time to read Peter's. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, savor it. Now remember that triangle that I said I would come back to? Remember that? Be going from the input to the output? That, whoa, that, remember that triangle? It's condemned. I thought it's it was just going to jail. Thus bad. <laughs> And you just go direct. <laughs> the shortest route between two places is a straight line. And this straight line works. And I'm going to tell you about the theory that makes the straight line. I'm reminded of Bjorn's talk, you need a new tool. And we got a new tool, which came from a beautiful, beautiful piece of two-category theory. So first thing we're going to do is translate our problem. Remember, our problem was we had this multi-category of D pseudo-algebras and pseudomorphisms with those miserable distributivity two cells. And we want to go from there to strict structure on the level of the multi-category of F algebras, which is just the multi-category associated to an honest-to-God symmetric monoidal category. We want to go from there to there in the shortest possible route. All right. Just let us with the operands you start life by turning <coughs> operat algebras into algebras over a monad. And you do the same thing for category of operators. Uh, Bob Thomas and I did that ages ago on the level of spaces. And it's the same construction. You construct monads in the two category of functors from pi into cat b. That's our ground two category. So pi, remember, just encoded the permutations, projections, and in, in, injections. It had no multiplicative structure. So it's a ground category that 
it still has all the G cross sigma and the information that Bert mentioned, because the permutations are in pi, and <coughs> if V is G spaces, the G is in the G V, in the G U. All right, the construction is perfectly easy, but we're using co-limits in CAT. Co-limits in CAT are scary. They're horrible. They don't commute with the classifying space functor. This is a formal use of a formal theory, and we don't give a damn. We're not going to try to commute co-limits for classifying space functor. OK. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to look at a way of processing the information. First of all, we refine our translation into a monadic context, or explain it. And the explanation is we start with monads d sub k that are defined on the category of functors from the k-fold Cartesian product of pi to cat v. Okay? And it's defined in the same way as in the case uh, k equals 1 that was in the earlier slide. And we have, uh, it's, it's blindingly obvious when you write things down, how to get a pairing of uh, monads, which starts using, it just doesn't. You just look, you're building this. That's the Cartesian product, k times. And when w itself is a Cartesian product, hey, you're, you're, you're just looking at Cartesian products and Cartesian products and everything simplifies. But the idea is that if we start with objects X of I, zero cells X of I, and Y, so these pseudo-algebras, then this guy is another pseudo-algebra, and so is this guy, the composite of Y with pi, lambda pi of the K. That comes from uh, extension of this, uh, this is just the smash product on finite base sets, but restricted to those morphisms that are projections, injections, or permutations. That's all it is. It's just a smash product of finite base sets. Uh, that extends to a thing where I would replace pi by d, and that's a miserable, horrible pairing. It's not doesn't have good strict properties, it's pseudo. But that is what you use to show that uh, this LKY is a DK pseudo-algebra. And then, then the notion of a k-morphism, this is the thing to take away. The notion of a k-morphism is exactly the category theorist standard notion of a pseudo-morphism of DK pseudo-algebras from this Cartesian product to LKY. It's a standard categorical construction, nothing deep. It's the axioms for uh, actions hold up to invertible two cells and map each of those two cells in the right way, and that's all it is. That allows us to apply the formal theory of <coughs> monads. That's a perfectly valid diagram. <laughs> it led to this version, but why is that awful? I was so happy when I discovered this, but it's just garbage. Throw it away. So, remind you, what is a co-equalizer and a reflexive co-equalizer? Well, you start with a pair of maps. We all know how to form co-equalizers, right? That's standard example of a co-limit. And then there's a reflexive co-equalizer where you insert that S naught, and you have that D naught S naught is the identity, and D one S naught is the identity. We already use this in EKMF. This is a good thing because it ensured that uh, if we take Oh, in this special case here, we're going to take 
uh, a map of monads. E is meant to be between D and F, because we're going to use it for both D and F. And we start with a map of two monads. Monads in our two category K. <coughs> we take E, apply it to C to go from E, D to E, E, and then apply the monadic product to go from E, E to E, and then we have this diagram. And it is a reflexive co-equalizer that ensures that E of E tensor over D uh, Y is isomorphic to E E tensor over D Y. And now you can just use the product on, me, on, on, on E to ensure that this guy is an E algebra. with me? All right. Now we get to the fun category theory. There is a notion of a reflexive codescent object. And the input data is like the two truncation of a simplicial object, where now, instead of having identities for compositions of faces and degeneracies, you have that there are prescribed invertible two cells. So it's not true that uh, D naught S naught is the identity. It's rather that there is an invertible isomorphism between D naught S naught and the identity. Right? We're just saying we're in two category. Nothing is supposed to hold strictly as you start life. OK. Does this seem OK? Mm -hmm. Not too hard. A co-descent object for such co-descent data is a pair consisting of a one cell and an invertible two cell. I mean, everything could be done with erasing the words invertible. We're just lazy. Uh, and you have to have certain uh, equalities of pasting diagrams. And this is universal with this two categorical uh, coherence property that is prescribed by these pasting diagrams. So remember that there was this information up here, the vertical two cells up here. And to, to describe the co-descent object and the universal property, you need to remember that information, which is what the pasting diagrams do. The essential point is that the universal properties are giving existence and uniqueness of both the one cell and two cell. Existence and uniqueness, concretely, strictly, strictifying structure. Uh, I have slides that give all the pasting diagrams. If somebody is foolhardy enough to ask a question when I'm done, I'll display them. <laughs> So just like the, the co-equalizer case in the monadic context, let's have a map of two monads. These monads are straight. Nothing in their definition involves two cells. They're just honest to god monads. And we define nu exactly the same way we did before. And now here is d0, d1, d2, s0, s1, d0, d1, and s0. Just write them down, and uh, for a few people in the audience, the resulting codescent object here is quite literally a two truncation of infinity category two sided bar construction. So, everything I've done all my career is two sided bar construction. So this is an example. I'm assuming subterraneously suppressing details, that all unit data is given strictly. And then all but one of the required simplicial identities between faces and degeneracies in this diagram hold strictly. The only one that doesn't comes from the fact that we only have a pseudo action uh, on Y. The pseudo action is given by a two cell from theta 
d theta to theta composed with mu. Do, do, are people familiar with monads and actions of monads? If you have a monad, uh, what am I using? D, D, E into D, E into Y. Y. You go into Y and then you go into dy, and you resist this. That, that diagram commute. But in a pseudo action, that diagram only commutes up to an invertible two cell. And that's the only thing that is non strict here. <clears throat> so when y is a d algebra, we don't have any two cells, but we do have this more complicated data. Let us write. C sharp y is just a notation. It's just like the tensor product, but it's a co-descent object instead of a co-equalizer. And that formula that I almost erased but carefully did not has the obvious two-level analog. So I'm not going to use the act notations for the resulting uh, cells witnessing the universality, but of course they are there. This is the point. These guys are strict because the universal property is precise. These are strict E algebras. Let's go back to processing our multiplicative data. As I said, E was a notation for something intermediate between D and F in our original context. We can apply this to the identity. And that gives a new equivalent version of the parallax strictification that I described before. It's a functor that takes uh, D pseudo-algebras to D algebras and strict morphisms does strictifies everything. But the multi-category associated to this animal is in the condemned cell because the distributivity constraints that we see in our multi-category are still there. They're still unstrictified two cells. And that miserable diagram that smuggled itself out of the condemned cell was trying to get around precisely that problem. And the neat thing is you can't, but you can get around it if you take the composite. Namely, we now apply this general construction, not just to D into E, but D sub K into F sub K for all K. And we get this kind of strictification that goes direct from DK pseudo-algebras and pseudomorphisms to FK algebras and FK morphisms. It's strict over here. Everything's nice. One was our description of, of K morphism in my original multi-category D, mult D, as a pseudomorphism of DK pseudo-algebra. Starting from there, we get a perfectly good natural transformations of functors from F to the K into cap B. First, we just notice that there's a blindingly obvious isomorphism like this, where we apply the strictification. There's the, the C lower sharp is simultaneously strictifying and changing from D to F. It's getting us where we want to, strictifying everything. So there's a blindingly obvious isomorphism like this. Since F is nothing but a K pseudofunctor, I can apply this functor on K pseudofunctors to land here. 
And then the universal property of this animal I'm pointing to gives me a map like that. And this is uh, my left con extension. I think I displayed, oh, I passed over because Bert had said it so fast. But the uh, construction of the symmetric monoidal structure on F category is given by a left con extension. <coughs> is, do, do people know left con extensions categorically? I, I could. This time I'll go back to the slide that I didn't show you. <coughs> that, this is the construction of the symmetric monoidal structure on F. You take the smash product and then you take left con extension along it of an obvious external product. That's how the left con extension is used to construct the uh, smash product on symmetric spectra or orthogonal spectra, but also the uh, symmetric monoidal structure on F categories. Okay? And it has a universal property, right? It is a left con extension. So maps external products to something composed with the smash product is the same as maps out of the tensor product, right? Okay. Right, so I constructed a k-morphism like this, and remembering that this guy is something composed with the smash product on F, we see that that's exactly the same thing as a k-morphism in mult F category. It's just a map like that. We that gives us our multifunctor from the multi-category of D pseudo-algebras to the multi-category of F algebras. Now, in a talk, that goes fast. But isn't that slick? The codescent objects are just, it's an amazing categorical tool. And just purely speculatively, I can imagine it, that general tool being wedded with uh, the take on infinity categories given by Emily Real and Don Verity where a huge chunk of infinity category theory is just enriched two category theory. Just a huge amount of infinity category fits into what the Australians have done for us. And this is an illustration of how you could actually go and if you wanted to, if you're an old fashioned evil algebraic topologist, and see things in strict terms. This is a, conceivably a way you might do some of that. One thing the formal theory that I've just told you about does not do is control the homotopy type. Uh, we want special objects on the D level to be converted to special objects on the F level. And Bert told you basically what the equivalences on the D level should be and also on the F level, right? The formal theory would actually see G cross sigma equivalences. And if you could get equivalences on the formal level, everything would be wrong. You would be getting nothing but equivariant Eilenberg lane G spectra products of equivariant Eilenberg Buglian, Buglian spectra. So you cannot expect this functor to give an equivalence in the two category here. By the way, this question of homotopy type is only a question about the underlying additive theory. It has nothing to do with mult. It's just part of the additive theory. So Bert said what's here now. We can translate from questions on the level of F, G, categories, which are where everything has been going on before, and now look at F sub G category, where we've built in G action on finite G sets. Now, there are 
prolongation functors from D pseudoalgebras to DG pseudoalgebras, and similarly on the level of F. And they commute just by inspection of the definition. And they don't follow up from a formal construction, but by inspection of the definition, this is true. And that, as topologically, as, as Bert indicated, we want an equivalence if and only if we have a level G equivalence after applying P. So now we transport our characterization of G equivalences to the level of FG categories, where everything can be done G equivariantly, and we're only looking for level-wise G equivalences. And then we, you know, we uh, work now in the ground category O of pi G. That just means the objects of pi G. You forget about the morphisms. And you look at functors from that. So it's a in Cartesian product of copies of cat G U, one for each object of pi G, where pi G is you know, equivariantly the injections, projections, and permutations. OK. And that's. Brown category now only sees level G information. And here comes a beautiful trick, which is due to Angelica. Namely, you can write down a G equivariant section from FG to GG. It's a level-wise G map. Has no, doesn't retain any information about permutations. But it does behave well with respect to the G structure. And then uh, it is a section which means that if I go from S and then back by C into FG, you get the identity. And then the other way around, that universal property of the co-descent objects gives an invertible two cell in the other direction. You pass to <coughs> spaces, and that's a homotopy. And it says that you get a G homotopy equivalence level-wise. And that set implies that if you start with something special, C lower sharp tends, sends it to something special. OK. All right. Akhil wanted equivariant K theory associated to uh, a Galois extension. And to get that, you just take this machine and feed small input into it. So I'm not going to have time to go through it. In, General, this is following an idea that is due to Elmendorf and Mandel. We're processing their idea in a totally different way, and it gives a new version of their constructions that Bert referred to in his talk. Uh, this is completely different than their construction. Uh, it extends to pseudomorphisms, and it extends equivariant, which is the point here. And that equivariant extension is what we're after. OK, so you can think of an operad as a kind of baby multi-category. And you can think of many others that <coughs> parametrize rings, modules, algebras, and rings, modules, algebras up to uh, contractible space of choices, that sort of thing. And then giving that morphism inside the multi-category that you're interested in, uh, any multi-category whatsoever is just a map x from q into m, where q is one of these parameter parameterizations of algebraic structures. So you'd have objects x q, you'd have k morphisms like this, and they give the kind of algebraic structure that you want to the multi-category, objects in the multi-category you're interested in, and then you process that in our machinery to get to the same kind of algebraic structure on the level of G spectrum, which is where we want it. So summary, we can transport any Q structure on PG categories to a Q structure on this machine that we've constructed. And it'll convert G categorical input to G spectrum output. Three examples, that was the example that uh, Bert and I needed for the uh, spectral category theory, uh, given important class of examples. But 
using this theory to hit that is like hitting a thumbtack with a sledgehammer. It's just, we don't need all that. Uh, but all such non-equivariant structures extend multiplicativity to, uh, by that geification function. Remember, I took the functor category of EG into anything. I can hit any non-equivariant or any naive G structure with that functor, and out comes genuine G structure. And then I can hit it with that machine, and there comes genuine structure on the level of G spectrum. But for all G, if I start with non-equivariant input, and I conjecture or guess is a better word, that that gives a global functor in the sense of uh, Anna Marie Bowman or, or Stefan Schrader. I, I haven't proven that, but it just feels right. Uh, of course, I love symmetric bimonoidal categories that have a direct sum and a tensor product, right? And these fit in naturally. There's a naive version where you start as your input parameter category, the operad P, which is just regarded as G operad with trivial G action. And that gives naive commutative ring structure to a genuine G spec. And Stefan in his talk gave an example of where such things arise. Little MO was an example of a global structure of that sort. And if we take this guy, that gives a genuine commutative ring structure to a genuine G spectrum. And that, in a sense, corrects a mistake that I made in E infinity ring spaces uh, before most of you were born. <laughs> Uh, this theory corrects. I thought that the operad P acts on itself in a way that it does not. And this effectively, if you look non-equivariantly, has the effect of replacing the action of P that on itself it doesn't exist with something that is good enough. And um, no, these two guys, Blumberg and Hill, have a paper where they describe intermediate kinds of operatic commutative ring structures of a genuine G spectrum. And this theory tells you how, if you can build the right operands in CAP, then you can feed them into the machine and construct new examples of the kind of intermediate uh, types of commutative ring G spectra that we know exist. We know some examples. We don't know operatic ways of dealing with all examples, but they're there. We know, we, we, we all believe that they're there. And one student of Mike Peter back there is working on exactly that. So is David White. There's going to be plenty of applications of that sort. So an algebraic K theory fits in and gives what Akhil used in his talk. So we start with a uh, Galois extension. You look at the big field, it's got an action of the Galois group, feed it into the machine, and that's going to be a genuine community of ring G spectrum, and its fixed point spectra are going to be the K theory spectra of the intermediate fields. So that's all proven. That's what, do you, what do you feed into it? Can't hear you. What do you feed into it? I mean, there's several ways to process the data, but I'm starting with a field extension with an analog group G. And then I have a G ring, F sub G. Okay? And one way of processing the data is to look at the general linear groups, finite general linear groups of the GLN uh, F sub G, the GLN, GLN F. These have G actions with G acting entry-wise on the matrices. And you can feed that in as a commutative, uh, 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 and see that it, build, that it builds a genuine commutative, uh, uh, bi-commutative, in fact, G category. So it feeds into the multiplicative version of the machine. Uh, I could say more. We have a different operand than the P sub G to which Everything I've said applies. And 
two actions of two different related operands on that. And you can feed that either into the machine I just told you about or into a machine that um, Vic like Anglevite and I started working on ages ago that carries through my original approach to my community of categories, but in a multi-categorical and equivariant context. It's a different machine. I don't know how to compare it with this machine, but they're both there. So I can give you several choices of how to construct what you want. Does that answer your question? Yeah. If anybody has any other questions, I'll try to give a less long-winded answer. I feel. Um, so I have a question about the beginning of your talk, or uh, from Brooks' talk. Does, does your notion of a symmetric or G-symmetric monoidal category, um, is, that, is that equivalent to some notion of categorical mapping functors? That's a great question. The, the, I mean, everything you do equivariantly, you take what you know not equivariantly, and it's got 17 different de generalizations. And so, I um, yell at this talk, we'll be talking about using uh, the third part of Bertrand's talk as a different way of manufacturing genuine G-spectra, but from Mackie G, Mackie functors. And I don't know how to relate what I've just told you to that approach. There's got to be a relation, but I don't know it yet. There's just, every place we look, there are new questions that are different structures that is, at this point, Largely unexplored. Egypt? Yeah. Did somebody have a? Maybe I should say the biggest unexplored area is computation. <laughs> we don't know how to compute a damn thing. Those guys on the Kavara variant problem lucked out. And they didn't need much calculation. <laughs> they just lucked out. It was a gorgeous, gorgeous piece of mathematics, but in terms of computation, they You're absolutely lucked out. What, what, what do you want to compute? <laughs> uh, I would like to compute equivariant characteristic classes. I computed all equivariant characteristic classes in Borel. And there's nothing interesting there. I would like uh, equivariant characteristic classes, for example, in the Mackey functor given by the representation rings, the relevant representation rings. That's hard. It's only known for line bundles. Even rationally, it's only known for line bundles. That's a really hard thing to compute. We take it as second nature, baby talk, how to do that non equivariant we don't know how to compute those things. So that's, that's just one example. I could go on and on things I'd like to compute. Dads work very hard in doing computations. I think you'll vouch for this hard work. <laughs>